everyone. Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I am Sherry Greenberg. I'm a clinical professor here at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, and I am the graduate advisor for the Masters in Public Affairs program. Just a little bit about me. I uh, have had several careers in the private sector with Standard & Poor's out of graduate school, then with the City of Austin as Capital Finance Manager, and then as an elected uh, member of the Texas House of Representatives for 10 years. And then, happily, I came to the LBJ School where I've been ever since. So this is not my first career, but it is my longest. That does provide some context uh, for me and for what I teach. In addition to being graduate advisor, I also teach at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. And um, there's kind of two sides of me. One um, is more of the management side, teaching public financial management um, and courses that involve uh, advocacy and uh, design thinking and things along that line. The other half um, does campaigns and elections and also is very much focused on issues of um, interest to those who are interested in urban affairs, uh, transportation, healthcare, education, digital inclusion and also legislative issues. I do a lot with technology policy, and so that is a thread through a lot of my classes. Uh, here at the LBJ School, as far as graduate advisor, I'm here to help the students who are in the Master's in Public Affairs program. And uh, that means everything from helping you with your goals and interests to your internships, advising, to questions, complaints, concerns, and of course, uh, conversation. So that's a little bit about me and my teaching and my role here at the uh, LBJ School. I'll turn it over to Lawrence. All right, so my name is Lawrence Rede. I am the graduate advisor for the Global Policy Studies Program. I'm a lecturer here at the LBJ School. I've been here for about um, uh, six years now. And uh, I also had a, a much briefer, but a, a, a <laughs> bit of a policy career before yeah, I went to the LBJ School. <laughs> LBJ school. Um, you're more experienced. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, I used to work in the European Parliament in Brussels, which is one of the institutions of the European Union. Um, and so I did mostly press work on uh, foreign policy related issues in, uh, in Brussels. So um, that's kind of my background. And that, uh, that influences my teaching as well. Um, my PhD is in international relations. So I teach uh, one of the core courses of the Global Policy Studies program called The Nature of the International System, which is where we apply international relations to actual policy problems. I also teach um, one of the other core courses, which is called Policymaking in Global Age, which is basically about decision making and how policymakers um, can actually get things implemented um, once, once, once they have ideas for what to do. Um, and I also teach a course on writing for global policy, which is a skills-based course where we try to get rid of all of the bad habits you've developed uh, as undergraduates um, writing for your professors and try to get you to get into a mindset of how would you write in the policy realm, where um, the point of the realm is basically one-page memos rather than 15-page research papers. So it's basically a crash course in how you write memos, State Department cables, congressional testimony, and blog posts, press releases, so actual policy documents that you might be called upon to write in your internships or your careers uh, once you graduate from the LBJ school. Um, and then in terms of my own research, what I really focus on is the European Union and its foreign policies, um, how the European Union as an actor behaves in the, in, in the world. And so I'm teaching a course on that um, uh, called the EU in the world, um, which is uh, sort of one of the topical courses that I teach. And just like Sherry for the uh, MPAF, uh, the Masters in Public Affairs, um, I am the Graduate Advisor for Global Policy Studies, which means um, all your questions about um, what you should specialize on, what courses you should take, um, how to navigate UT's bureaucracy, um, what kinds of internship opportunities to look for, how to go about looking for um, your, your next career once you graduate. I'm your first point of contact if you're in the Global Policy Studies um, realm. And Sherry and I work a lot together in terms of yes. Uh, looking at course schedules, making sure you can take all the courses that you want, um, and just generally advising you throughout your two or maybe three um, three years here. So what we thought we'd do is basically um, go through just the kind of um, uh, real quick back of the envelope, how, what do these two programs look like, the Master's in Public Affairs and the Master's in Global Policy Studies, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, the sort of more specific differences between them, especially if some of you are still unsure which one to, uh, which one to apply to. Um, and then go a little bit into uh, a pitch for why the LBJ School as a whole is maybe a little bit different than other programs you might be looking at. So I'll have um, 
Sherry, start with this Absolutely. brief intro to what, what MPATH um, is going to look uh, like. Very brief. I will share that, as Lawrence um, stated, writing is a very important component here at the LBJ School in making presentations. I uh, share his view that the writing needs to be concise and to the point, whether it's a memo or, a, as I say, a one-pager with bullet dots. So you will see that we have a lot of common themes between us and between the programs. Having said that, the Masters of Public Affairs program is a, a two-year program, and I have actually been um, here since I left the uh, Texas legislature in 2001 at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, so I've seen um, the MPATH uh, program now over quite a few years. And the um, one of the cores of the MPATH program is the Policy Research Project. Uh, there is also a Policy Research Project for Global Policy Studies. And uh, the Policy Research Project is a two-year experience with a you know, real-world client. And um, you find out about those projects when you come to orientation. And then, as I say, you use your dance card. You sign up for your preferences. And you stay in that Policy Research Project class for two semesters. Um, in addition to that, there are certain courses that are core requirements, um, and those would be um, an intro to methods class, an intro to economics, microeconomics, public financial management, and then there's the flexible core where you will take a policy development on different topics as well as an advanced methods and advanced economics class on different methods. Um, and there is also a public management uh, class that you take. Uh, beyond that, there is an internship requirement for both of the uh, programs. That internship requirement is 400 hours with one entity. Um, most students, but not all, choose to do that internship over the summer because it's much easier to get the 400 hours, but you don't have to. There are students right now who are doing internships that will continue into the summer or in the summer into the fall or fall and spring. The important point is it's 400 hours with one entity. In the Master's in Public Affairs program, you have a choice as to whether you want to take that internship for what we call academic credit or administrative. Academic credit, you sign up for a class, you pay for it, and you, it counts as an elective seminar, three credit hours. There is another choice in the Master's in Public Affairs to, as I say, just check the box and get administrative credit. You've done your internship, but you don't actually get uh, course credit for it. So. I don't want to go into uh, too much into the weeds. Those are some of the major components with the uh, Masters in Public Affairs uh, program here at the LBJ School. Great. So let me give you just a, a, a brief uh, run through of the Global Policy Studies program. Um, we have a number of core courses that all of you will, who enroll in this program would be required to take. One is um, the two courses that I already mentioned, the nature of the international system and policy making in a global age. So the first one is about international relations and how you can use those those concepts to, to figure out what's going on in the world today. And the second part, which you take in the spring of your of your first year, is policy making in a global age, which is if you're sitting in a decision maker's seat, um, what are the pressures on you? What are the different things that are going to um, affect how you make decisions? We also have an economic sequence. Um, in, in your first semester, you will take microeconomics for policy. So it's microeconomics, but really focused not on how an ideal free market works, but rather what happens when um, policies are actually made to intervene in this market. What happens if you um, if you actually raise tariffs? What happens if you um, uh, regulate certain um, industries? What happens if you um, tax certain activities? So it's really about the, um, the policy um, side of microeconomics. And in your second semester of your first year, you take international economics, which focuses much more on international exchange rates, international trade policy, um, international financial transactions, and again, especially on um, what kinds of policies are going to be important here. What are the distributional consequences of all of these things, and how do you how do you affect that from a policy making perspective? Um, and then two more core courses that you're required to take. One is the uh, writing for global policy studies, which is basically um, getting you to to get much better at writing real policy documents. Um, it comes a lot in handy when you go off into your internship. Um, uh, I'm just talking to all of those students who came back from their summer internships who kind of belatedly come to my office thanking me for the course mm -hmm. because um, they actually got the, uh, the best assignments from their bosses because they were the ones who could write memos um, in, in the shortest amount of time and with the, um, uh, with the best results. And a course on analytical methods, which for the GPS program, 
covers both qualitative and quantitative research methods. So basically, you just want to make sure that you can know what kinds of questions you can ask about policy, and then depending on what kind of question you ask, what are the methods that you need to use to answer them, because you need to find that right fit. Um, two things that are um, particular to the GPS program, one is that we also have a global crisis simulation that we run once every two years. It's a one credit course that is usually taken in the spring. Um, we have the US Army War College come in um, and they run this massive, um, essentially, um, model UN on steroids for our, for our students. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's basically a weekend-long, really intensive exercise. And the Global Policy Studies program has a foreign language requirement, which means in order to graduate from our program, and this is important, this is not a prerequisite to enroll or to apply, this is a requirement before you can graduate from the program, is that you need to show um, some proficiency in a foreign language. And there are two ways you can do that, uh, because I get a lot of questions about this. Mm -hmm. One is you can actually take a placement test here at uh, UT. We have language departments for pretty much any language you can think of. And if you um, place uh, up to you know, pass the, um, the fourth semester level, then, um, then just passing that test will, will, will count as, as fulfilling that requirement. Or you can show that at some point during your um, undergraduate career or a combination of your undergraduate career and while you're at LBJ, you have taken um, four semesters worth of language. Um, and uh, the only caveat being you can't take Spanish one four times. So by four semesters of language, I mean you took you know, French 1, French 2, French 3, French 4 at some point. This doesn't need to be all at the same university. This doesn't need to be at UT. This can be a combination of your undergraduate um, degree and here at UT. Some people take uh, language courses at Austin Community College here uh, because the, the times are, are usually evening times and they work better with their schedules. But that's one difference between the, the two programs. So, um, yeah. I wanted to highlight just yeah. a few more things, and that is that we also offer many dual degrees. Mm -hmm. um, I know among both of the, of the uh, MGPS and Masters of Public Affairs, they're a little bit different. Um, you know, we have 14 dual degrees with the Masters in Public Affairs, and there are quite a 11 few with, with, global, policy with global policy studies. And don't quote me on that number because it may have changed as we're speaking. But the important point there is that these are three-year degrees, or in the case with law school with MPATH, four-year degrees. Uh, but that gives you lots of opportunities, and this is something that we see that there's a lot of student interest in. So please follow up with me if you have questions about any of the dual degrees that are listed on the website. Also, in the Master's in Public Affairs, there are specializations that are optional, but that's something else to look at. And the Graduate School of the University of Texas at Austin has what are called portfolio programs. And these are programs that have a home in a particular department. Um, such as LBJ or law or communications or Russian studies, whatever it may be, but um, they have courses that span all of the graduate schools. And with the portfolio program, it's actually noted on your uh, transcript. For the portfolio programs and specializations with MPATH, basically you use your electives to satisfy those. But I think that this is important to point out because we have the benefit of being at a major university that's a major research institution, and there are these advantages of this type, whether it's specializations or portfolio programs or dual degrees. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Also, there are opportunities, if they're approved by Lawrence or myself, um, to take courses uh, from across campus that can count as electives if they're approved. And then there is one other thing I wanted to mention, that's the DC concentration. Mm -hmm. And this is a program we've had now for several years. It's an accelerated program. And um, I say that because students spend one year in Austin, and students in this program only get one elective. And then um, after May, they go straight to DC, where they start a, uh, an externship. And it's a, uh, and it continues from the summer through the fall. And they are interning while they are going to classes, and they graduate in 18 months. If you have questions about that, Tom O'Donnell, who's on the website, would be the person who can give you uh, the most details. But um, that sometimes we do get questions on the DC concentration, and I did not want to neglect that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this 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 brings us nicely to to you know just a quick. Um, uh, discussion of, of how we are different from other yes, programs. Um, so um, let me give you a couple of um, 
couple of reasons, you know, why why I think the LBJ school is is is, is really a special place, and then I'll have um, Sherry fill in yeah. fill in the blanks as well. Um, one of the things that you need to realize is that um, the LBJ school is at UT Austin, and UT Austin is one of the biggest um, tier one research universities in the country, which means pretty much anything you can think of, there's probably a world-renowned expert on that particular topic somewhere here on this campus. And the reason that that really matters for you is because one, you might be able to take a course on that particular issue with that professor, but also it expands your opportunities for getting involved in research, mm -hmm. um, for going Absolutely. to talks, for getting involved in centers. Um, every week or so, somebody emails me being like, oh, what do you know about this center? And it just opens my eyes to the fact that I've never heard of this center before. Um, and there's a bunch of people on this campus who are who are doing um, who are doing work on on amazing things. So both in terms of course selections, but also in terms of how many people you can talk to who are experts in the field, and get involved with them in other ways, whether it's just through going to their office hours or whether it's you know being their research assistant, TAing for them, anything like that. Um, this is actually a great a great opportunity. So UT is really really huge, and and it's a great resource for you to use. Um, and many of the other um, Either public affairs programs, but especially uh, from what I know, the global policy programs, international affairs programs, are not at big universities like this, especially not the good ones. So um, this is really the, of all of the, 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 the good um, public affairs and global policy studies schools, um, the LBJ school is at the biggest university that, um, in terms of what you can find. Contrary to that, though, the LBJ school itself is quite small. So the incoming class size for, um, for, for the GPS program is usually around 45 students. For MPAP, it's roughly twice that, more or less. Right, 100 to 110. Yeah, so that's not very many people. It means that you get to really know your peers. Um, the faculty to student ratio is very high. Um, and so um, you really get to know your professors. Um, it means that you have a lot of time to spend um, with us faculty members in terms of office hours. We get to know you. We can help you um, by giving you access to our personal networks in terms of when you're looking for internships, when you're looking for careers. Um, and so what I like to say is I went to, to Georgetown for my undergrad, uh, for, sorry, for my, for my uh, master's degree. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, Madeline Albright was teaching there, which is great, right? But it's not like I ever got to chat with Madeline Albright. I mean, her office hours, you know, had like a line out the door. Whereas here, um, you know, we have uh, you know, a diplomat in residence. We have a CIA, CIA officer in residence. We have uh, several people who have uh, worked on the National Security Council and the National Intelligence Council. Um, we have people who were elected um, state legislators. We have all these um, amazing people, and they have a lot of time to spend with you. And so that's, that's something that's really important, that you have this combination of having this small family atmosphere where you get a lot of individualized attention and a lot of individual resources, especially in terms of networking. But sort of at this huge right. um, research university that is UT. So that, I think that's, that's one thing that's unique. The second thing I would point out is that um, the, the culture of this, of this place is actually very collegial mm -hmm. and very um, collaborative. Um, again, to give you an example, you know, um, when I was at Georgetown, there was a lot of um, type A personalities there. It's a lot of elbowing, trying to get, get, get to the top of the class. There's basically none of that going on here at the LBJ School. Um, a lot of the um, courses that, that you're taking, for instance, the policy research project, which you take whichever program that you're going to be in, right. involves a lot of group work where you need to rely on each other. Um, anytime that I'm walking through the halls, people are studying in groups. All of our faculty members encourage this. Um, and so it's a very collaborative and, um, and cooperative environment, which is not something that you'll necessarily find elsewhere. Um, and then finally, one, one other thing I would note, note is that compared to other um, schools, um, we're also quite cheap. And, uh, I know As in that, inexpensive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we know that that's actually a big, a big concern sure. because, um, and I hate to bust your bubble in case I'm breaking news to you, but um, a lot of public policy careers are not exactly setting you up to be billionaires. Is that a so, spoiler alert? Yeah, exactly. Um, so that, mean, but this also means that if you are um, going to a very, very expensive school where you need to take out um, uh, tens and tens of thousands of uh, dollars of loans, um, there are certain jobs that might be really interesting to you. For instance, working for a small nonprofit or a small NGO that you will not be able to take simply because you won't be able to, um, to actually make ends meet. And so, um, for that reason, uh, I also find that at the LBJ school, we have more people who are interested in kind of nonprofit NGO work. Mm -hmm. Um, than similar programs that I've looked at. Um, 
so that that also gives us a gives us a certain flavor. Um, so those would be the main things I would point out. I don't know if uh, you want to jump in here. Sure, absolutely. So I do want to emphasize the friendly atmosphere. I think it's very important to acknowledge here that although we're in a major um, and tier one research institution, it is a very friendly atmosphere. Uh, the students want to help each other out. The faculty want to. Um, I'm available almost all the time as graduate advisor. Students have my cell number. They text me. So it's a, a really um, friendly and um, this is your home. Uh, beyond that, Austin also is your home and that has many advantages. Yes, um, I will not comment on the restaurants and bars. You know about that. But beyond that, um, Austin is a major city. It is a growing city and there are lots of opportunities in the public, private and nonprofit sectors and lots of people to connect you with, not just here, but nationally and globally. So I think that's an advantage. And in some years, it's an extra advantage because this is also the state capital. So every other year when our legislature is in regular session in the odd year, which this will be, for instance, I teach a Texas legislative process and internship class where students have the opportunity to actually intern uh, at the Texas legislature during session. So that's another example of, of a rather unique opportunity that you get here at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. And uh, beyond that, I would say that there are just boundless opportunities and that there's really a, a, um, a wealth of resources uh, to connect you with as far as internships and your career goals. So I think that that's really important to, to recognize here at the LBJ School. Yeah. All right. And then so um, the last thing I would add to that is um, whichever program you end up, um, end up uh, applying for, um, one of the things that we want to make sure is um, it's clear to you is that both of these programs are very customizable, right? So um, Sherry mentioned that um, that there are optional specializations within yes. um, within the MPATH curriculum. For the GPS curriculum, you need to pick a specialization, but um, if you don't like any of the ones that are offered, you're free to make up your own um, and make a custom specialization. Um, there are very few students who graduate from the LBJ school without having taken a class outside of the LBJ school, right. so um, somewhere else on campus, so that's also very customizable. Um, so there's, a, there, you know, all of these dual degrees and portfolio right. programs that um, that Sherry mentioned um, give you, you know, all sorts of customizable options as well in terms of other add-ons um, or maybe even a dual degree yes. that you could do, which gives you, you know, added flexibility and also, you know, with all of these other units on campus come other opportunities. For instance, different kinds of scholarships, fellowships that you can apply Research. for. Research centers that we have, you yeah. know, dozens and dozens of research centers here at the University of Texas. Some are affiliated with the LBJ School, um, and I'll mention uh, a few of them in a second. Um, some are not, um, right. but a lot of them are, are are kind of second homes for our students, and that's where they get a lot of their um, uh, their practical in-depth right. uh, research experience. So to give you a few examples, I'm going to give the global ones, and I'll, I'll, I'll give, let Sherry yeah. give the, the more domestic ones. We have the Clement Center for National Security, where a lot of our students um, get fellowships from. Um, uh, and, and uh, do research at. They also run a, a portfolio program in security studies. We have the Strauss Center for International Security and Law. We have Innovations for Peace and Development, which is a massive um, uh, research. It's not called a research center, but it effectively operates as one. Um, it's run by actually our Associate Dean for Students, Kate Weaver, um, with um, over, I think, 80 students working there. Um, some of them undergrads, but many of them graduate students. Um, the law school has the Rappaport Center for Human Rights. Again, not associated with the LBJ school, but we have some summer fellows there um, almost every year. Um, and so almost anything you can think of, there's probably a research center about Absolutely. it, uh, including all of these area study centers that I think, uh, especially for those who are interested in the rest of the world, could be of real interest to you. If you're interested in Eastern Europe, we have a center for Russian and Eastern European mm -hmm. studies. If you're interested in Europe, we have uh, a center for European studies. If you're interested in South Asia, we have a South Asia Institute. So pretty much any, we have a Latin American studies right. program and a Latin and American studies degrees. center. So it's just the customizability is pretty much endless. I think that's really important. The fact that you can customize and the flexibility, whether it is doing some of these special programs we've talked about or taking a course elsewhere um, with our approval. Um, as far as some of the centers here at the LBJ School, we have CHAS, the Center for Health and Social Policy. We have our GK that specializes in philanthropy and nonprofits. We have uh, Energy with Varun Rai. 
We have Peniel Joseph, who has a center with a lens on um, equity issues. We also study for have, race and democracy. That's yeah. right, study for race and democracy. We also have around campus centers, whether it's in community regional planning, uh, communications, you name the school, and somehow there's a, a hook with policy and with public affairs, and there are centers all across campus. These also give you additional opportunities for research, for TA, and being a major research university, incoming students frequently find, too, that they have the opportunity to be a TA in an undergraduate course, which, of course, gives them um, the possibility for some added income. But I do want to emphasize that this flexibility is really important here at the LBJ School, as is the fact that we combine theory and skills with real-world applied learning. And whether that's applied in the community here in Austin, whether that's your internship, your policy research project class, working with centers, um, being a research assistant. And you never know when these opportunities will pop up, for instance, to do research. Just as an example, um, sometimes they're one-off, which I happen to have. I just received a grant from Cisco, um, not, the, not the Cisco Foods, but the Cisco that's the technology company, and it's with a colleague of mine who's in the iSchool, the School of Information. So we just received a grant. It'll be funding for one year, and we're going to be um, looking at machine learning, um, artificial intelligence, and what are the regulatory and policy and ethical and human-centered effects of that. Um, we'll be starting interviews in the spring, and so I will be um, hiring a um, graduate research assistant for the spring. So that's just an example of some that pop up. And then some of the centers, such as CHASP and some of the others, have regular opportunities with ongoing research. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, uh, just to emphasize this, one of the things that, um, that I think, especially for those of you who are interested in the Global Policy Studies program, um, you might be, in terms of your other research, looking at other programs in international affairs or U.S. foreign policy or, um, or, or things like that. And one thing I want to emphasize is that we are at a public affairs school, which means we are going to be very much um, on the practical side of things. Right. So I, when I teach my international relations course, it's not a a history of the theory of international relations. It's all about giving you some tools and then seeing if you can apply it. Um, my students just wrote um, the midterm where they actually had to um, pick um, a current event from one hat and an international relations theory from another hat and use that theory to explain that current event. And they were all, you know, current events from the past week in, um, in, in the news. Right. So we're always focused on the practical um, application. The real world. Exactly. And then the last thing I would say, and, and this is, I, I want to have both of us say a little bit about this, is the, is the differences between the two programs, because right. I know some of you are sometimes on the fence between yeah. the two, um, especially those of you who are interested in, in, in some sort of foreign policy. And I want to make it clear that just because you're interested in, um, in foreign affairs doesn't mean that you necessarily need to take uh, need to apply for the Global Policy Studies program, although I think you should. But, um, but <laughs> let me just give you a do, sense. Yeah. Have, yeah. uh, but let me, uh, let me give you a, a few key differences between right. the two um, if, if, the, if you're trying to decide between the two. One is that, as you heard us describe, the core curriculum for the two, um, okay. for the two programs is very different. Um, the MPATH one is a little bit more quantitative heavy. That doesn't mean that if you want to do quantitative work, you need to go to MPATH. It's just um, you can choose to take all of your specializations and elective courses in the uh, MGPS program on quantitative methods and, 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 and those kinds of things, but we will not require you to do so. So there's a little bit more of a the sort of lowest bar for quant is a little bit higher on the <laughs> MPATH side than it does on, on the GPS side. Conversely, um, the MPATH program does not have a language requirement. So right. um, a foreign language requirement. So that, that sort of mm -hmm. um, is, is, it might also make a difference. You have to weigh all these things. You have to weigh all these things. But right. mostly what I want to explain is that the Global Policy Studies program is really about looking at um, global policy issues and how we can best, um, again, practically, pragmatically think about fixing them. Right. So let's say we're talking about um, uh, migration, um, which is a big, a big topic right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you might actually find that for instance, with the migrant caravan that's been in the news um, for the past couple of weeks, that actually not much of this has to do with the United States. This depends on, you know, in terms of actually looking at this problem, where you need to look for um, both the explanations of the problem and the potential so solutions are the Honduran government, um, the um, ways in which um, organized crime and um, uh, in South America is, um, is, is a problem. 
um, Mexican NGOs and how uh, you know corruption. Can, and, and corruption how you know first of all in terms of like Mexican um, politics and, 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 and corruption but also NGOs in, in Mexico who can help these um, migrant caravans sure. um, survive right so there's not necessarily a focus on the US whereas if you're looking at it from um, an empath perspective it's going to be okay what how does this this migrant caravan, if it does at all, affect U.S. policy, U.S. foreign policy? How would we? How would somebody in the State Department think that. about right. um, what we can do to, to to help this migrant caravan? Right. Um, and so, the the focus is going to be much more on sort of the the, the U.S. policy making process at a local, state, and federal, federal level, responding to global events. Whereas from the global policy studies, we're not going to necessarily think or concentrate solely on, on the U.S. So that gives you, so if you're interested in, in, in for instance, yeah. immigration, you could find a, a home very either much in, 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 either, yeah. in either program, right. but that's going to be a little bit of a difference in flavor of how we approach the question. Yes, but I do want to say there are not these brick walls and yeah. hard and fast. So there's flexibility among both, and with the Masters in Public Affairs, it's both public policy and public management, right? And so you have a way to to, to customize or not. You can choose to do specializations or not. So if you're interested in urban and state affairs or um, foreign affairs or technology, you can do a specialization or not. You can remain a generalist. Um, there is also the opportunity to decide if you want to look more at a public management track where you may want to do consulting for Deloitte or be eventually a city manager or head of um, a state agency or a federal agency or um, head of the executive director of a nonprofit, for instance. Um, in looking at the courses, um, I would say that you know, we, we try to be flexible. And there are some courses that we offer that are open to all students. So for instance, I have a seminar I'm teaching right now that's called, What is a Smart City? Question mark. Question mark is intentional. But we look at cities globally and everything from equity to Internet of Things. And so that is a course that's open to, um, you know, all students. And so you will find that we have that flexibility also in, in quite a few of the courses. Um, and where you'll find students together in a course who are both uh, empath and MGPS. Yeah. So I think that's that. Yeah. That, that's me, sort of. Um, oh, I want to say that you want to add anything else in yeah. admissions. Yeah. I, I just wanted to touch on admissions for, um, for specific questions on admissions. You can contact our office of student admissions, who can give you very specific direction on admissions. But just in general, we get a lot of questions on that, and I think it's important that to know that here at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, we have a holistic approach to admissions. It's not looking at one grade, one score. We're going to, of course, look at your transcripts, your grades, your GPA, your scores on the test, but it's a holistic approach to admissions. So your essays and what you have to say and your career goals and do you show a passion and what you have done potentially in community service or in um, other study abroad or whatever it may be is also important to give us as well as your references of course to give us this um, broad view of you as a person where you have been where you are now where you want to be and your passions and then we take a holistic approach to admission yeah. the the one quick two two quick notes on that one is um Please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I have recruiting Skype calls and, and phone calls and, and meetings in person with um, with several people each week who are interested in the GPS program. Um, and I so, do the same. And, yes. Yeah. So um, so feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. And one of the questions that I get most often is sort of how do I optimize my, my cover letter? Right. Mm -hmm. And the right. one the one tip that I would give you, and I think this is true whichever program you you decide to apply to, what we really want you to do when you apply here is have a, a really good reason in your own mind for why you're coming to the LBJ school. This is a professional school, right? So what we are trying to do is figure out exactly what kind of um, career you want to go into. And this doesn't mean to have one specific job no. in mind, but just generally, like, what do you want to do? I want to work in a, in a foreign policy think tank in Washington, D.C., or I want to work um, in um, evaluating programs in, right. you know, generally for international and development. Human services. Or, yeah, human and, services. and let me, I just do want to point out that our students, um, they 
are everywhere. They're in state, local, federal government, they're in nonprofits, they're in NGOs, they are here, they're everywhere, they're across the globe. Some of them are in, are in the um, private sector, whether in intergovernmental relations or in technology or um, in a consulting such as Deloitte. So we're not trying to pigeonhole you, but we're saying it is important to know what your passion is and, and talk to us about that. Yeah, and so, so one thing that I really look for in a, in a cover letter is just having that kind of focus where right. you know what you want to um, do with this degree, right? And so mm -hmm. my, my suggestion would be to you um, to really focus on what is it that you're really interested in doing? And that both has a, a policy um, sense in terms of like, oh, I'm interested in like, you know, wildlife conservation, or I'm interested in transportation policy. Or but also a management perspective. Right. Um, but also like what kind of job you want to get yes. out of here. Do you want to do advocacy? Do you want to do implementation? Do you want, want to, to do, do consulting. consulting, right? And the reason I say this is because as we told you, there's just such a wide variety of things you can do here. Um, what I want to avoid is you coming here and then being overwhelmed by your options. Right. So you need to have that focus for what you actually want to get out of the school because we want to make sure that the school is a good fit for you. Um, that's that's primarily the our, our role as um, you know as an admissions committee is not just to, to pass judgment on right. you, but to basically say you should probably go somewhere else because what you want to do we can't do. Um, Although so we can do almost anything you want. There are very few things that we can't do. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, but but I think it is important um, to to show that that focus that intent to be intentional. Having said that, that doesn't mean that you have to come here with your mm -hmm. whole life plan in place. And sometimes people come with a certain focus and they, oh, they change. change. That's totally they fine. change, or they they decide they want to be generals, or they decide they want to be specials, and that's fine. You don't have to have your whole life figured out, but you have to be intentional in your application. Yeah. So, I think we should um, stop blabbering yes. at you and get 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 you to questions, ask any questions please. that you might have. Um, I believe we have. Um, 20, over 20 minutes to take questions. Yeah. So um, type them in, and then um, as far as I know, what we're going to have is we're going to have Amy just read them out loud to us because right. the screen is really far away it's from really for us, tiny. and so yeah. we can't read them. So um, please feel free to, to, to type in any of your questions. Yes, please. Um, I, I really want to stress that there's not a stupid question. No. Uh, you know, if you have um, the question, somebody else has yeah, the same question. Exactly. So um, anything that has to, yeah. and as, as detailed as you want to make it or as general as you want to And make if it. we don't know the answer, then we'll try and get the information and get back to you. And hopefully uh, Amy is uh, noting those. Yeah. Please, we're open for questions. Sherry and Lawrence, I have a question for you guys. Um, a, lot, a question we get a lot from applicants is, you know, they're concerned maybe about the quantitative requirements to get in. Maybe they've been out of school for a while, or maybe their uh, bachelor's degree didn't require a uh, heavy math load. Do you have um, sort of some advice to give students who are concerned about that quantitative requirement? Sure. Um, I, can, I can certainly respond to that. Um, there... There are, there is some base mathematical knowledge that you need. However, um, there are students who enter and find that um, they, once they're admitted, they can get online and do a self-assessment. And if they find that they need, you know, some boning up on their mathematical skills, there are several options. There is a self-study that they can do online through the LBJ school. There is a course that they can take here in the summer that doesn't count towards their degree, but it's an actual course that they can take to help them with those skills. Um, there may be courses elsewhere that they can take. And um, once they're admitted, there's information that will go out regarding the self-assessment and the options if they need help with the self, um, with their math skills on that. Also during orientation, um, there are additional sessions to help them with their math skills and um, opportunities to uh, retake the assessment. Yeah. So just so to, 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 to clarify, once you're admitted, um, which usually happens around, um, you know, March or April. April right. is when you have to let us, know. let us know whether you're coming or not. Um, it's not like we disappear off yeah. the radar until September. What actually happens is that in May, um, late May, we get in touch with you and we have you um, join this very detailed online mm -hmm. um, orientation during the summer where we might give you some summer readings. We're going to give you a lot of resources to boon up on your math skills. Um, You'll we we'll have question and answer that you can post. Um, yeah. we, we sort of let you get to know each other so you can find roommates right. and all this stuff. So um, basically, you start you start at the LBJ school pretty much late May. Mm -hmm. um, as being the, part of the community. As being part of the community. And part of that yeah. is actually us helping you with, right. with, with those math skills. So if that's something that you're worried about, um, 
I, I don't think that's necessarily something to worry about right, right. now. What I would say is, um, generally speaking, what, what you really need in order to, to, to do well in your core courses is um, a solid knowledge of algebra yes. and statistics. I agree. Um, if you have that, um, you, should be, you should be good to go. I, I, exactly. All right, thanks. We actually have some, some more questions that have come in. Um, the oh, first sure. being, um, if a student has already applied for the LBJ school, when should they expect to hear? Um, in terms of speaking from the Office of Student Affairs and Admissions, typically applicants who have applied before the December 1st deadline um, are typically notified by uh, maybe January or February. Um, so I'll go ahead and answer that one. Um, the next one being, uh, do you mind quickly reviewing the example you gave regarding the different approaches to MGPS and MPATH like students would take in regards to immigration? Additionally, mm -hmm. did I hear correctly that MPATH focuses more on the quantitative side of things? Well, so there are, um, on MPATH there is a second, for instance, methods of course that's a quantitative or it could be qualitative. So for instance, there's two methods courses and then there's a uh, microeconomics course, an intro, and um, an applied economics where you have choices of different topics. There are some students that they have really strong economics backgrounds such as they majored in economics, they may waive that or if they were a statistics major undergrad may be able to waive that. But having put that aside, to move on to the discussion of immigration, migration, um, that was an example of a topic that you could approach in two different ways, right? So as Lawrence was saying, in global policy studies, it may be, what are the root causes globally of that migration? What's going on in Honduras? What's going on in Mexico? What's going on in the Mideast? Wherever you may look, okay? Um, whereas you may take an immigration class um, in the empath side that would say, okay, what does this mean and what are the effects in the United States? What does this mean as far as immigration um, policies? What does this mean as far as politics, regulations? What does this mean as far as local government issues, state issues, federal issues? So that was just an example of um, one course and how you may look at a, a one topic, I should say, and how you may look at it with different lenses. Yeah. So yeah, to, to, to add on, so in terms of the, um, the, the, the quantitative um, side of things, what, what I wanted to emphasize is that um, in the Global Policy Studies program, um, once you've taken microeconomics and international economics and the sort of quantitative parts of your analytical methods course, um, if you so choose, you can choose not to look at numbers ever again. Um, if you choose to, you, you can go, and I've had um, students who basically focus on data management for right. international development, and they took crazy courses in the computer science department about like, you know, big data analysis. That I didn't even understand what they yeah. were doing. So you can do a lot of quant under GCS. It's just the sort of, you have to do basically two and a half courses, whereas there's a little bit more to do in Although on the empirical methods, um, we will make sure that from now on that the second one can be qualitative. So it's not necessarily that your second methods class would be math. It could be one that's focused on qualitative interviewing skills, focus groups, and things of that nature. So I want to just make sure that you understand that the second method class actually could be qualitative. Um, as far as the economics, the, the, the micro, and then the second one is applied, which is different, uh, topical. One that I taught for 14 years, haven't taught in the past uh, few years, just bandwidth, but may go back to uh, next year. And that mm -hmm. focuses a lot on, on, um, on uh, budgeting, and um, contracting and other issues in um, public financial management um, at the local state level, so nonprofit and a little bit on uh, federal. But as with the MGPS program, you have 
possibly choosing some of the um, second methods classes I mentioned. You could choose one that's qualitative, where you're learning interviewing skills and focus groups, or you could choose one where it's very much going to be on being a data scientist and using Tableau, Python, and Tableau. Um, the same with the uh, second economics class. You could choose one that is very applied to an area such as um, urban or environmental, or you could choose one that is very data oriented. For students um, in MPATH who, who want to be more data oriented, it's the same thing. You could, by choosing electives here or looking at which you choose for those classes that have flexibility in the core, or doing a um, specialization or a portfolio program, for instance, with statistical reasoning, um, be much more data focused, or you could decide that's not where I want to be. I want to focus in a particular policy area, or I want to focus in particular management and leadership areas, or I just want to be a skilled generalist, as we say in the impact program. Yeah. And there's one one final point on on this kind of MPAP versus MGPS difference. If, for instance, you're looking at immigration, I just think it's a it's a it's a good example because right, it's clear, it, it clearly fits within both um, within both programs. Um, we have some courses here that are on on U.S. immigration policy, on um, Latino politics, right. which obviously is very tied in with immigration, right? Um, with sort of, um, we have a course co-taught by, by two of our professors that right. really focuses on, on sort of the role of culture in terms of, you know. um, yes. uh, in terms of um, you know, how, how we think about American politics in terms of culture and this being a, a, a culture of immigration. Those are all things about how immigration relates to the U.S. Again, local, state, right. federal levels, right? Um, in terms of the students who are looking at immigration policies in the Global Policy Studies program, I encourage them to take courses like um, refugee law. Right. International human rights law, mm -hmm. um, certain um, courses in um, the Asian studies and Latin American studies right. and Middle Eastern studies departments, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's more looking at um, migration as a global phenomenon, and you know, incidentally, sometimes that might you know be very much influenced by U.S. immigration yeah. policy. Clearly, those are interrelated. Right. Um, but it's just that we're not necessarily going to focus on the U.S. policymaking setting in which to look at um, look at immigration. <laughs> And I also want to make sure this is not like a value judgment of one yeah. is better or the other. Yeah. They're just different ways it's of looking different at It's different lenses, as I said. Yeah. Yeah, different lenses, exactly. Are there questions? Okay. Yes. Any we have questions? one more question. Um, we have a question okay. about the uh, number of credit hours for both programs. Could you all touch on that a little bit? Sure. So the number of credit hours for both programs is a tiny little bit different. Um, for MPATH, it's 48, which basically translates to what normally people right. do is four semesters of 12 credits each. We usually Correct. run three credit courses, so that means four courses four each semester. Four courses each semester, right. The MGPS program is 49 credits, which is one credit more, and the reading, yeah. uh, the reason for that is because we have this crisis simulation that I right. mentioned, um, which is a one credit course in one of your spring semesters. So for mm -hmm. if you're doing a GPS program, you're going to be doing 12 credits every semester, but in one of those semesters, you're going to be taking 13 because you do this crisis simulation. But otherwise, it's, yeah. it's, it's quite similar. And one thing I did want to mention about the 48, that's true. The, 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 the simple math is if it's 48, then you're here for two years unless you're doing the D.C. concentration. And then you spend, um, as we've noted, part of your time in D.C. But um, if you're here in Austin uh, for the MPATH program and you're not doing a dual degree, then it is 48, which with the math, with three credit courses, is four courses each semester, right? 12, right? Do the math, you come up with 48. However, if you choose to do your internship as a class and sign up for it as the internship class and pay for it, then that counts as an elective. And so that is an easy way to have in one of your semesters taking nine hours instead of 12 because you may want to be doing something community or working or you have a, a big opportunity for a GRA or your TA. Also, I did want to mention that we have the opportunity at the LBJ School to sign up for conference courses. This is a, a three-hour um, course where you, time there, you really want to specialize in something and so there's a, the ability to get with a professor and kind of design your own course and work with them. And um, I know I'm doing several of those this semester. So I didn't want to neglect what we were talking about flexibility and also a way um, to fulfill um, some hours for an elective where you really want to do something that's quite specific, the ability to do a conference course. Yeah. 
Right. Any other can questions? You, can you say more about examples of the internship projects like the client organizations or so on? For the for the policy research projects? Or for internships yeah. that you do? Internships. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, so what I heard is, 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 is that you have a question about what kinds of clients have approached us for these policy research projects. Is that, is that right? Yeah, no, yeah, that's right. So, okay. so for, let me give you a couple examples from the global side and then Sherry can give you some from, from the domestic side. So we have, um, uh, recently there was a um, policy research project done by Paul Pope um, where um, the client was basically the, um, the National Security Council. Um, mm -hmm. They asked uh, our students to uh, think about how um, special operations forces and intelligence um, gathering can, can better be coordinated. And they actually briefed their results to the National Security Council in the White House in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Um, another one, um, I believe it was the MacArthur Foundation that funded a, um, a PRP that was run by Dr. Alan Cooperman on um, looking at um, MOX fuels, which is basically um, spent um, nuclear fuel and how you can um, store it, how you can safely get rid of it, and sort of what, what are the best policies around this, um, doing a, uh, an international comparison uh, between, I think, Japan and a couple of uh, Belgium, mm -hmm. uh, the US, and a couple of other countries to see how they deal with this issue. Um, uh, Dr. Kate Weaver has done several um, PRPs for the Crook Foundation, which is a big um, uh, international development yeah. foundation, working on um, evaluating um, uh, food aid programs in Africa, specifically with how they are um, helping or hurting uh, gender equity, um, so the effects mm -hmm. on gender politics. So those are kind of three ones that just come to my mind yeah. straight away. Maybe you can mention three from the Sure. MPAP. From the empath, um, so just as an example, if we want to talk about different types of clients, um, I think I did have done five with Congressional Research Service, and three of those were on use of social media by uh, members of Congress or committees, and one of those was just uh, published and went to uh, members of Congress a few weeks ago. So that's an example from Congressional Research Service. We have PRPs, though, that are funded and have clients from the state of Texas, where Cynthia Osborne has done quite a few looking at um, child and family policies. We have PRPs that are funded by um, foundations, for instance, looking at workforce or by um, looking at um, gender issues in the workforce in the public sector. We have one now um, along those lines. We have PRPs that are um, have as clients um, City of Austin. Um, for instance, looking at um, housing for the elderly, or I did one last year that had the housing authority of the city of Austin um, as a client looking at housing and how that relates to social and economic mobility. We also have one this semester that is um, looking at EVs, electric vehicles, and the charging infrastructure for those. That's just an example yeah. of some. Good. Other questions? Anything else? I have uh, one more question for you guys. Um, I know you touched, okay. you just touched a little bit on the PRPs, but could you touch a little bit more on the professional report? Is that typically something that's required? Okay. Is that common for students to pursue? And so on. Sure. I'm happy to do that. So in the Masters in Public Affairs uh, program, and I know Lawrence can talk about any differences with um, the Masters of Global Policy Studies, but the uh, professional report is not required in our curriculum. It was years ago, but it is not now. And, but there are instances where either a professional report or a thesis is required. So in the Masters in Public Affairs program, if you choose to do a specialization, then the professional report is required. Uh, for many of, for the dual degree programs, there is a requirement of either a professional report or a thesis depending on uh, the program. Um, and so that is a requirement for the dual degrees. For um, some of the portfolio programs, there is, for mo almost all of them, there is some sort of culminating product or project that may or may not be a professional report or thesis. It could be a project, it could be a capstone. So those. Uh, vary. Um, so in the standard curriculum, the professional report is not required, but if, if you choose to do a uh, specialization, um, it is an impasse. If you're doing a dual degree, 
there will be a PR or thesis. And then if you're looking at some of these uh, portfolio programs and concentrations, there could be something that's PR or thesis or some other sort of culminating project. Yeah, so just two, two quick notes on that. So all of this applies to the Global Policy Studies Program as well. If you're a dual degree student, you need to do some sort of PR or thesis, otherwise it's not required. In terms of the advice that I give students, I think it's worth it to do a professional report if you are thinking of at some point maybe a PhD or going further in academia, because it shows that you have done a, an independent yes. research project that you've seen through from beginning, beginning to end. It also gets uh, added to UT's library database, so you right. kind of have a have a, uh, a record of you having done mm -hmm. something like this. Um, for but one of the things I want to link it back to is we were just talking about these conference courses, which is basically yes. our, our name for independent studies. Right. If you, um, doing a PR has a bunch of different deadlines associated with it, a bunch of different formatting uh, requirements. So it's, it's, you know, you have to do a lot of extra work, not just write a paper. Right. And that's and because so, this, is, this is dictated by the graduate school of the University of Texas at Austin when you do a PR thesis. Exactly. So if you're just interested in the topic and you really want right. to do research on it, um, sometimes I advise students, well, why don't you just do a, an independent study, a conference course for a professor, and then um, you can basically write what would have been a PR, but if right. you don't actually care about um, you know, this being on the UT Library website and any of those th types of things, then that might just be an easier, an easier option. Um, but, but if you want to be published in that way, be... then you should do the PR thesis. Exactly. Um, but, it's, but it's certainly not a, not a requirement, um, right. and for certain students, um, we, we sort of advise it or advise against it. But that's a good question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. I think that may be all the time we have left, unless there are any other questions. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we sign off? No, I think, you know, if you have any other questions that we couldn't answer or that you were too embarrassed to ask, then please um, uh, yeah. shoot us an email. Yes. Our emails are up on the website, um, and so you can, you can find it very easily. Um, we're very happy to chat with you. I generally tend not to answer very long emails because that takes forever. I prefer right. if you just call me and then we can chat for five minutes and I will give you way more information than I will be uh, willing to type out because that just makes my hand cramp. So um, get in touch with us. Um, yes, shoot me an email and, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you and, and answer any questions that you might have. And please also, yeah. with any kinds of administrative questions about the application process and all of those things, reach out to Amy or one of our other graduate coordinators there. They are, they are wonderful and professional, and they will answer all the questions that you might have on that front. I agree. OSA is a wonderful resource and uh, can answer some of these admission questions that are very specific in great detail. Lawrence and I are available uh, to you. We make ourselves available. We want to work with students. We want to help students. And we can also look if there are other faculty members you might want to speak with. Uh, beyond that, I concur with the email. It's really hard to have a true conversation that way. Uh, we can get on the phone, we can Skype, and also I tell folks that if I don't answer my email within 24 hours, it means it was lost in this just onslaught of email. Uh, the number that I have up is actually my cell number. Um, you can text me, but if you do, let me know who you are because I won't know your cell number, but I'm happy to respond. Um, to a text and then to then set up a phone call. So thank you all for your interest in the LBJ School yeah, of Public thank, Affairs. Yeah, thank, thank you all for, for, for participating. And yeah. uh, uh, one thing I will say is, you know, this is a, you know, when you're making your choice about graduate school, it's important to go visit the places that you um, right. that you're interested in. So hopefully we'll get to meet you at one of our open houses. And we have um, one coming up in November. We have, we have one coming up in November. Um, also, if you if you've applied and you're 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 quite far away, um, if you've you know. Once we've accepted you, we also have open houses for yes, admitted students when you're trying to make your decision. So I encourage you to come to those. So hopefully we'll um, see you at one of those or um, next August when you when you join us. Yes. Thank you very much. You've included Thanks. the link to register for the open house and both Sherry and Lawrence's email Wonderful. addresses in our chat. So feel free to reach out. Thank you guys. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you.